welcome to Classical Schmassical, the anti-classical classical music podcast. Tune in every Saturday as we discuss, deconstruct, and dissect what it means to be a musician in the modern world. I'm your host, Alexa Letourneau. I use any pronouns you like, and our guest this week is Lydia Yankovskaya. Hi, thanks so much for having me, Alexa. Yeah, thank you so much for being here. Um, I'm super, super excited for our conversation today. Uh, to get to know you a bit as we begin, can you talk briefly about your career and how you got where you are today? So I'm a conductor and I conduct uh, both opera and symphonic repertoire all over the country and the world. And I'm also the music director at Chicago Opera Theater in Chicago and the artistic director of Refugee Orchestra Project, uh, which is a Boston based organization, but we perform widely. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, so I'm curious to to get us started. Um, opera has become sort of a bigger focus of mine in, in recent years. Um, how do you go about planning an opera season and what is that process like? That's a great question and one that I rarely get asked, but I wish people asked more often because there are so many things that go into planning an opera season and so many of them have nothing to do with music, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, there are um, so many, there are fantastic operas, of course, uh, and, and endless choice. So in some ways it makes it a little bit easier because otherwise, how do you choose what to program? But I would say the first thing with any company is to figure out what is the focus of this particular organization and who sure. is this organization serving. And that's something I think about a great deal when planning a season at Chicago Opera Theater or when planning, I mean, the same I think goes for symphonic repertoire when planning a season with any symphonic yeah. organization. Um, and uh, we are lucky at Chicago Opera Theater because we are part of a larger ecosystem within Chicago. There are so many opera organizations and classical music organizations here. Yeah. But we think a lot about who is the community that we're serving and who are the people we want to reach. Because opera certainly to me is just such a, a an art form that has so many possibilities mm -hmm. uh, and so many opportunities. And there's so many things, um, so many different kinds of people that it can reach, especially if we make people aware of what this art form is capable of, I think many people are not aware. Um, yeah. And but within uh, any given opera season, even the biggest companies in this country program six, maybe eight productions a year. It's not mm -hmm. so many uh, mm -hmm. for us. It's three big productions and then some smaller auxiliary events. Yeah. And then within that, we figure out what is our focus. And at COT, we have focused on developing new work and doing world premieres and pieces that are really of and for today. Also doing work that um, has already premiered but has not received a second production or mm -hmm. maybe deserves greater recognition or maybe premiered in the last 10 years, for instance, and has traveled yeah. widely but hasn't yet made it to Chicago, for example. Um, and then additionally, we try to showcase works that are more from a more classic repertory that come from the past, but that have not yet been seen in Chicago. And that's also sure. a huge amount of repertoire that may be phenomenal, yeah. but just hasn't made it here. Yeah, I think that that's really encouraging to hear as a composer, um, especially like I'm starting work on my first opera and there's this big old question mark of like, will this get heard or am I writing this as an academic exercise and knowing that there are companies out there that are really prioritizing new works is something that that is so so good to hear. Um, so with that in mind, how do you approach uh, like an operatic score that you're going to conduct and is a process different when it's been written by a living composer or this is a premiere and, and you're you have that extra like collaborative force. Well, I would say my process of studying the work is very similar, whether it's a classic work or something brand new. I still think mm -hmm. about the text and the drama and how musically we tell yeah. that story and how all those elements relate. And um, I always try to really dig in and study the work before I even talk to the composer and see yeah. what I what I see and what I get out of just seeing it on the page. But obviously having a living composer, a living librettist, having living creators is an, an incredible opportunity and resource. Yeah. We 
because I can't go back and ask Bizet what he meant to do in right. Carmen, and especially since there were there are so many things that changed around their different versions of the piece. I can't ask why those versions or how they came to be what they came to be. Right. Well, with newer work, for instance, right now I'm in the middle of conducting uh, Mark Adamo's Becoming Santa Claus yes. at Chicago Opera Theater. And uh, there was one section, for instance, where the one of the sopranos, a Amy Owens, who has this very high coloratura soprano part that jumps kind of up and down in the register. And she had a question about a couple of places in the tessitura in a couple of places, yeah. and the choices that Mark made there. And Mark said, oh, you know, actually, I originally wrote it in this other way. And then I changed the tessitura for the soprano who premiered it because she had this unusual voice that did this and that. Yeah. And, you know, you should probably do it the way I wrote it originally, which is not what's <laughs> in the score now. So it's always fascinating to know how changes came to be made, what was specific to a specific person and to be able to adjust it, but also to ask for what the composer intended. There's so many, there's so much room in it in making interpretive yeah. choices. And some of them are clear cut. Some of them may just be strong decisions on the, my part or the director's, but others it's so helpful to know what the creators were thinking, what their through line yeah. was, uh, what their motivation was, what kind of colors also they imagined. Uh, yesterday yeah. we were in an orchestra rehearsal and there's one spot where there are two possibilities for the, the way that um, we color the orchestration. Do mm -hmm. I focus on these instruments or bringing out these timbres? And it changes the quality yeah. of the delivery. It changes even the way the aria can be perceived or those words in the aria can be yeah. perceived. Um, so in the moment, I got to try both orchestral timbres and say, Mark, do you like this one or this one? And what were you intending? Do you prefer it um, more focused on these instruments, the mental colors or these ones? And yeah. it's amazing to have that opportunity and to have the composer in the room. Yeah, that's lovely. And you mentioned becoming Santa Claus. I wonder if you can tell us a little bit about like the process that that's had, about the storyline, why a Christmas opera and like where, when and where can people watch it if, if they're listening from the area or yeah. Yeah, well, Becoming Santa Claus is uh, going up. Our opening night is on Saturday. So is that tomorrow? Tomorrow. Well, the yes. 11th, December 11th. The day, that, the day that this premieres, that's going live, the premiere night for, for both things. So super Great. congratulations. And there are also opportunities to catch it the following weekend on Friday and Sunday, the following weekend. Uh, it's a delightful, delightful opera. It is a holiday story in that it's a kind of origin myth for Santa Claus. If oh, had Santa Claus had a clear origin myth within our culture, but it is not specific to any one religion or culture or yeah. um, or holiday tradition. It's it's a very universal story, which was one, is one of the things I love about it. Yeah, and I think it could play just as effectively in July as in December. But it's this wonderful tale that Mark came up with of where did Santa Claus come from, as we know him. And in this story, Claus is a 13 year old elf prince. He is extremely bratty and spoiled. He is more focused on having material gifts of the highest quality and that are the most expensive um, than anything else, partially because he's been disappointed by some of the people in his yeah. life and some of his family members. And over the course of the opera, he comes to term with this. He he finds out that his three favorite uncles, um, the kings of Persia, India, and Arabia, cannot make it to his birthday because they're going to the birth of some special child somewhere. Oh, wow. He's very disappointed by this. <laughs> he, he asks what kind of gifts they're giving the child, and it turns out it's things like frankincense. And what would a child do with frankincense? He decides to outdo them and out of spite he creates he works with works his elves to death his uh, the servants in the castle and creates these wondrous amazing toys and gifts um yeah but in the end he gets to bethlehem too late uh, he misses the, uh, the the christ child everybody's already gone and he thinks about it and he realizes that gifts aren't about outdoing somebody or spite or the material yeah. aspects. They're really about something that comes from the heart. Uh, and he decides to give away the toys to all the children in the world. That's so lovely. Yeah. 
And I, I just, what a, what a fun story. Definitely wish that I was in the Chicago area to check that out. And hopefully some people can hear about it here and, and go and see it. Cause it seems like such a fun, fun story. Yeah. Um, and I'm also very curious. So as somebody who conducts many different kinds of ensembles, what draws you to opera and how is it different? How is it different conducting an opera versus an orchestral work or something, of, you know, maybe chamber music or what, what is that like? Cause I don't really know a lot about conducting to be perfectly honest. And I'm really curious. Yeah, I would say the biggest thing with opera is the amount of collaboration that goes into putting mm. an opera on. The number of people involved who have to work together very closely, yeah. and the number of elements involved. When I work with a symphony orchestra, first of all, the program is usually shorter, although that depends. This opera is an hour and a half long, so it's about the length of a symphony concert. But uh, when I work with a symphony, my job is to show up with a really strong interpretation and idea of the piece and to obviously understand what the orchestra is bringing to it and work with the mm -hmm. orchestra, but ultimately in a short period of time to just put together um, a performance that uh, that clearly conveys my interpretation and combines that with what the orchestra brings to the table uh, yeah. to create a great musical performance. Um, in opera, I have to do all of that, but much more. <laughs> you still have an orchestra, uh, first right. of all, and you still have to come up with that uh, interpretive idea and bring something to the stage. But you're also working with the stage director, and you have to make sure that all the musical ideas and the dramatic ideas align into one. Because yeah. if the two f are fighting each other, unless it's by design somehow, uh, it can cause problems and it won't be an effective performance. Yeah. So a big part of it is just working collaboratively with a large group of people and making sure that these ideas come together. But also working with singers adds a whole nother element because in an orchestra, each instrument, of course, there are some differences, but more or less a violin is a violin and a flute is a, is a flute. They, of course, there are different qualities of instruments and different types of, of instruments, but they're all built more or less the same way. And with the human voice, there are as many voices as there are people. Yeah. No two performers will be alike. You can't uh, exactly anticipate how a certain voice will function. Plus, singers have to worry about text and movement right. on stage, the dramatic movement, and all of that affects also the vocalism. And they have to worry about delivering the drama of the piece in the moment. Yeah. And all of that adds so many other elements that one has to worry about both in the rehearsal room and in the moment of performance. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the speed at which a set moves can suddenly change something. Right. Or this opera has many comic moments and the reaction of the audience may affect how we yeah. time something or how we approach it or how we're doing it in a given way day or frankly, the way the singer is feeling that day or right. you know, what if someone's a little tired or their body's reacting to things in a certain way. There's always this element of something changing of surprise. Yeah. Uh, and I love that about opera. I love symphonic performances because there is a certainty to them much more so. And once you know exactly how you want to present a piece, you can present it that way. And in some ways it's sure. It's yeah. more sure as long as you come prepared with what you want to do. But in opera, um, it's both much more frightening, but also much more fun in some ways because you yeah. have this element of surprise and you have to be able to adjust on the fly and to make it effective for that moment. Sure. Yeah. It's really interesting to hear because I, like I said, I'm working on my first opera now and like thinking about the drama of the music versus the staging versus how are you imagining this character's emotional arc and what does that look like in the singer's but it's it's a whole lot to think about and and knowing that there is this sense that that is that is happening on all scales of the production is well, really really writing the opera i mean writing an opera is an enormous undertaking it's so hard because as a composer you not only have to understand all of those musical elements like you do for writing an art piece of art song or oratorio or all of yeah. those things, but you also, in a sense, you are the director and you are right. the actor for the singers because you create the sense of dramatic timing. You create the way in which a line is delivered, a line of yeah. text is delivered. Um, we have a program at Chicago Opera Theater called the Vanguard Composers Program, which uh, is 
an opportunity for composers who want to discover opera to really dig into this world and to write their first opera. Yeah. Uh, and it's amazing just how much there is to think about and how much uh, they have to discover over these two years. And these are usually composers who are already very accomplished coming into the program. Yeah. Yeah. So a little bit of a selfish question, but building off of that, do you have any advice for composers as they tackle their first operas? There are so many things to think about. <laughs> I would say um, really dig, I would say the number one thing is really dig into some of the operas that have survived through the centuries mm -hmm. and try yeah. to figure out why. And I don't mean just go and watch a production because that doesn't really tell you anything. That tells you about how that piece was interpreted in that one moment. I would say sit with those scores. Um, if you don't speak the language, find operas in languages that you speak. It's easier, yeah. I think. And or uh, or really uh, get a word for word translation of every word so you can understand, yeah. write it in so you know exactly how the composer was setting the text. Um, but dig in and look at why choices might have been made for mm. every single line of text and every piece of music. And then try to watch, um, especially for operas for which this is available, try to watch 10, 15 different productions or listen yeah. to different interpretations of it and see how differently people approach it and why and how that can totally change the nature of the piece also and what does yeah. the composer put in that is not changeable and what right. adjusts with the moment and i think most importantly i would say the hardest thing for composers writing opera is figuring out where to leave room for interpretation and where to be crystal crystal clear on what they intend yeah. and i would say that most composers who are tackling opera for the first time never not find neither of those things <laughs> it, it ends up being somewhere in the middle where yeah. it both uh ties uh the singers in too tightly into what they have to do but also doesn't clarify certain things it's, it's sure. such a difficult thing and it is so nuanced yeah and figuring out where to give space and where to let go um and it's especially hard with comedy actually i would say writing comedy yeah. is the hardest thing because dramatic timing becomes so essential sure. and that dramatic timing some of it has to be determined in the moment and how to make that work but yes i would say look at operas and see what you love about them and what you don't love and study as many as you can and if you're not a theater person spend a lot of time in the theater take acting classes um, yeah. watch rehearsals if you can because also with opera by the time you go to see an opera and of course it's important to see and hear productions and uh, but by the time you're there that opera has been in development overall probably for several years and in rehearsal for oh. over a month so see if you can find a way to get into some of those early staging rehearsals yeah. and see how artists interpret a piece and how they make decisions about how something should be performed yeah that's really really helpful and wonderful advice and definitely something that i've been like dipping my toe into but it's it's definitely I think that's been super helpful and going even deeper will, would really just bring it to the next level. I thank you and so there's, much. There's just yeah. so much. Yeah. And I would say also singers, yeah. well, get to know singers. If you're not a singer yourself, oh, yeah. or if you haven't worked with singers uh, a great deal, really get to know some singers. Ask if you can sit in on their voice lesson or coaching. Yeah. Many will be open to that. But so that you can start to understand what are the things that singers struggle with and what yeah. are the things that they love or don't love to do yeah. <laughs> um, so that if you push the boundaries of the voice which is great that you do so from a place of understanding but yes yeah. so listen to singers talk to singers watch them work on different things um and different kinds of singers and also in different parts of their vocal development because i think yeah. that's important too not just to hear the people who have been at it for 20 years and have reached sure. the pinnacle of their vocal technique but also those who are still figuring it out yeah I, that's another thing that's really helped me is i have i have a roommate who is a singer and when she found out that i was writing an opera she was like well what kind of sopranos and i was like I sure don't know. And so we sat and we listened to recordings and she was like, oh, you want lighter than this? Okay, let's try this. How about this singer? Is this what you're going for? And I was like, almost, but something a little bit. And so we were able to workshop that in a way that like, I now know what it, what it is that I'm after. And I have like a few singers of that 
specific Fach that I can listen to and say, oh, okay, here's how their voices work. And it makes so much, there's so much more clarity that I have in my, per, in my characters simply because like she took the time to make sure that I understood what I wanted. That's amazing. Exactly. And it's so great to have that experience and to have someone who can guide you through that. And in reality, it's actually even much more endless than that, because we categorize yeah. voices into Fox just because we have to have some way to right. do certain things. But in reality, as I said earlier, there are as many voices as there are people and it becomes right. such a challenging thing to figure out how do you create as a composer a piece that will get performed and that many people will be able right, to perform, right. but also that is tailored to whoever has to do it first. Yeah, yeah, that's so helpful. Thank you so much. In in the same vein of giving advice, um, what advice might you have for young conductors, especially conductors who may not see very many people who look like them in positions of power in the classical music institutions right now? I would say do what feels right to you and pursue what you want to pursue. Uh, when I was starting out, there really weren't any women doing this or uh, sure. very few, just about every place I went, I was the first. I mean, I yeah. see that still happens a lot, which is uh, ridiculous in this day and age, but yeah. um, certainly at that point, that was the case. And I had multiple people just say to me outright that women shouldn't conduct. No one could give me a good wow. reason as to why, but multiple people, including people my own age, including musicians, uh, people who were themselves conductors, I mean, all kinds of people, which was very surprising. Yeah. I was lucky to also have really great advocates and supporters who encouraged me, who gave me opportunities, who put me on the podium, who told me to keep going. Um, but I never really imagined that a, a big career like this was possible or what it entailed. I really just didn't have a clue. I just knew that this is what I wanted to do and that I couldn't live without it and that it was the right thing for me. And I would say ultimately um, what helped me and for each person it's very different, especially with conducting because it's so personal. It's about a lot of it is about leadership or expressing yourself. But I would say um, the, the main thing for me was um, figuring out just what is it that that mattered the most to me what was the kind of music making i wanted to make yeah and how did i want to make it and who am i as a person and how do, do i most effectively express that to get the best art making and to move the yeah. audience and i think that's the key focusing on the goals because ultimately as a conductor what is my job my job is to bring two people together to make them sound as good as i possibly can yeah. And in a way that is impactful to the audiences that come to hear us uh, perform. And I think as long as you focus on that goal rather than what people tell you you're supposed to do or how you're supposed to do it, you will make great music. And that's what matters in the end. Yeah, that's so beautiful. Thank you so much. Yeah, and you mentioned this a little bit up at the top. I'm wondering, can you tell me a bit more about the Refugee Orchestra Project? That sounds like an incredible, incredible project. Yes, so I run an organization called the Refugee Orchestra Project. I myself came to this country as a refugee from Russia and uh, the organization highlights uh, refugees from all over the world from different eras, including now and then and in the past. Um, and the incredible contributions that refugee composers and musicians in particular have made and continue to make to our culture and society. Many people don't realize just how many refugee musicians have influenced everything that we know about yeah. music today. And music, again, is, that's just the aspect of it that I know. But sure. um, of course, that's the case in all areas of our culture and society. Uh, but both in terms of Irving Berlin, for instance, who was a refugee and who wrote things like God Bless America and so many popular songs that came to be staples in what we know of as popular music today. Yeah. Um, but also within the classical world, people think of Chopin as a French composer, but Chopin, yes, he was right. a French composer, but he was a French composer who came to France as a refugee from Poland yeah. and would not have had this career or shaped the era of romantic music had he not been given an opportunity to restart in a new place. Yeah, 
Yeah, that's that's amazing. Yeah, thank you so much for that work. What is how is I don't know exactly how to phrase this, but how is like geogra geographical location has that had any impact on your music? Because I know I think if I remember correctly from from reading uh, a little bit before this interview, um, you're sort of newer to the Chicago area, coming from the East Coast, and then coming from Russia as a refugee, what is, how has your location kind of impacted your art, if, if at all? Yeah, well, I think in each place, you have a different audience, you have a different culture. You also have people who have been exposed to different kinds of music, which yeah. affects what we love and how we react to things, because Definitely. what our experience of music is, um, that experience is shaped by a combination of what we're hearing in the moment and also what our expectations are and what we know. Yeah. So if you're performing, for instance, for an audience of people who, let's say, have never been to a classical music concert, but they've listened to a lot of um, techno, they will love a minimalist composer, perhaps, for example, because it's, it's the roots, actually, the music, there are many musical connections, right, yeah. between the two. But the same for any other types of music, right? Um, so I think the culture of the place, what kind of music permeates um, the, the general culture of the place makes a big difference. The uh, also, frankly, what kinds of subjects people are interested in that are non-musical because music doesn't exist in a vacuum. It's an art, it's reflective of our world. Yeah. So what happens in our world and how people are doing, how they're feeling, how they're dealing with it also affects their reaction to certain music. Uh, I think that's very important, but also in each place, uh, the cultures of playing are different. Each yeah. orchestra plays very differently, and that's even true within the United States regionally. The yeah. way uh, orchestras in Chicago play is different from the way most orchestral musicians in Boston play, which is different from the way they might play in Houston. Uh, yeah. And that depends on many things, including uh, what who are the main teachers of the conservatories in that area, who have been the conductors and musical leaders in that era, area, yeah. and what kind of color they've been looking for yeah. from an orchestra. I definitely feel that, especially like I, I just, I'm sort of new to the New York City area from Illinois, and it is so huge, especially like we have even have this concept of uptown and downtown music in Manhattan, and it's just like, the location of my school making a difference on the music that's happened. It, it's it's truly like kind of bizarre how much of an impact it has. But like you were saying, it, it makes a lot of sense when you think about the musical culture that kind of influences that that relationship. The musical culture and non-musical, just culture at large yeah. and how that impacts the music making. Yeah, definitely. Um, I want to be really respectful of your time. So as we're wrapping up, do you have any other projects or things that you'd like to talk about or promote? Yeah, I think um, at Chicago Opera Theater, we have a number of other exciting performances. So as I mentioned, Becoming Santa Claus opens, uh, I think the same day that this gets released and then yes. we'll be running the following weekend as well. Mark Adamo's score is absolutely brilliant. And next spring, I will not be conducting this. Uh, we will have a, a guest conductor. Um, uh, Jerry Lynn Johnson, who's wonderful coming in, but at Chicago Opera Theater, we're premiering the world premiere of Quamino's Map by composer Erilyn Wallen and librettist Deborah Brewart. They're both phenomenal artists. Erilyn is a UK based composer, but who has written, I think, something like 20 operas. Oh, wow. Uh, but they've been performed much more widely in Europe than here. And I'm very yeah. excited to bring her here with that project. Uh, and otherwise I have a few symphonic concerts coming up and anyone who's interested can visit my website, which is LydiaYankovska.com or LydiaConductor.com. My name is spelled L-I-D-I-Y-A, Conductor.com. Um, and you can see a full schedule of everything that's been announced for the next few seasons. Um, and yeah. of course, also, since I know that you have composers who listen to this podcast as well, I would encourage any composers who are thinking about writing opera, or maybe they even haven't thought about writing opera, but love telling stories through music and through the human voice to look into our Vanguard program. We take applications every year and it's a two year residency at Chicago Opera Theater in Chicago, which includes also a world premiere commission. 
Yeah, amazing. Thank you so very, very much for joining us here. Um, and thank you to thanks to you at home as well for joining us at Classical Smashical. If you enjoyed the show, there is definitely plenty more where that came from, so make sure to like and subscribe so you don't miss any episodes. And if you'd like to continue this wonderful conversation that we've been having, please join the Discord link in the description, or visit our Facebook page at facebook.com slash classical schmassical, that's schmassical, S-C-H-M-A-S-S-I-C-A-L. And remember, as always, stay classy and questionably classical.